you we worship you you know I feel the Lord here tonight I really do um can I ask a favor the lady who is on the keyboard can she run back here real quick wherever she is I just want to huh yeah is she around thank you um can we just be up standing to our feet one more time I know we've been we've been on our feet a lot tonight but that's okay You see, what, what I really want to see happen tonight cannot be manufactured by a sermon. It must be a work of the Holy Spirit. Anything, anything of significance in our lives that takes place cannot be a work of the flesh. It must be of the Lord. You see, the result of what I would love to see tonight in my heart is not temporary enthusiasm because of a conference. It's long-lasting change in our lives, including myself. You see, the mark of authenticity is not momentary excitement, it's longevity. I'm going to say that again to you. The mark of authentic moves of God is not temporary excitement. Friend, I could bring in a secular preacher tonight who can talk to you about a dog adoption center and you can get excited for five minutes about a dog adoption center. But it doesn't last. Why? Because it doesn't have an eternal value about it. But anything that the Lord does that is authentic has longevity about it. That's why I'm, I'm not too impressed by preachers who get famous overnight for five minutes and then suddenly they fall in the faith. What impresses me is ministers who have faithfully served God for year after year after year. And they are faithful with the call of God. And they serve when it's easy. They serve when it's hard. They serve when people are with them. They serve when people leave them. That when everyone's popular, they serve God. And when no one's popular, they serve God. Friend, that's what God's looking for in this hour. Men and women who will give their very lives for the cause of Jesus Christ. Can you say Amen. So what I want us to do is just lift our hands to Jesus and close your eyes where you are. I want you to forget right now who's around you. And I want you to even forget how many years you've served the Lord. I want you to forget that you came for a conference. Because we didn't come for a conference. You came for the Lord. Conferences don't change people. Jesus does. I'm going to say that for you again. Conferences do not change people. Jesus changes people. Sermons will not touch your life tonight. Jesus touches your life. Maybe you came here. I even feel in my heart tonight, maybe you're even one of the missionaries who's here and you're tired. You're weary. That sure, you've talked about what you're doing for the Lord tonight, but deep down, you're tired and you need the Lord to touch you tonight. I have good news. There is one who says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, friend, tonight, I'll be honest with you. I, I wasn't the first pick for this conference. I wasn't meant to be here, but I do believe the Lord had me come here. And the first thing I will tell you is this. Knowing about me will not change your life. I've come to talk to you about the man, Jesus. It is Him and Him alone tonight that we need. Our ministries don't impress Him. He's looking tonight for our yieldedness. He's looking for hearts who say, Jesus, I need you. I need you. Maybe you say tonight, Jordan, I, I don't have a need for the Lord. Everything's going well. Then friend, your greatest need is that you don't realize you know the need of the Lord. You say, Jordan, I'm in my late 80s my life is coming to an end no friend while there's breath in your lungs the Lord needs you right now the Lord needs you there is not one person in this room who is not needed of the Lord in this hour 
See, we have to understand, church, in the kingdom of God, no one gets to sit on the sidelines and watch the game take place. I'm glad you agree with me, brother. Now, for the rest of you who didn't agree with me, no one in the kingdom gets to sit and watch the game take place as you spectate. God, listen to me, God does not believe in lazy Christianity. If you are calling yourself a Christian tonight, you have no business doing nothing for God. You have no business. Well, I'm old. Doesn't matter. So is Abraham. Friend, that's your Bible. That's not, I didn't write that. Well, I've got no courage. Neither did Gideon. I'm in a dark place. So was Joseph. I can't speak well. Neither could Moses. I have anger problems. So did Peter. I've done terrible things. So did Paul. You're in good company, friend. Oh, I believe it's an hour that we stop giving God our excuses and we give Him our yes. I say we give Him our yes. But friend, that cannot just be a, a, a theoretical yes. It has to look like something. It has to go beyond the excitement of this moment while this British guy is talking excitably to you. And it has to actually go to Monday morning when you don't feel excited and your neighbor's still cussing you out. And there's something in you like my sister at the back there who in her older years is still saying, whether you want Jesus or not, you're going to get Jesus. That's what God's looking for in this hour. Those are the people he's looking for, friend. See, I'm not qualified. I don't find many people in this Bible who were. He doesn't want your qualifications. He wants your yes. He wants your yes. Friend, there is no telling what God can do with a life that will simply say yes over and over and over and over and over again. So tonight, what we need to do before we go anywhere is we need to yield to the Holy Spirit. Because before I bring this word to you, I want your heart to be in a place where we can receive it. So can we lift our hands to Jesus all over this room? I want you to close your eyes. Forget about me right now. I'm not important. I can't help you and I cannot change you. But I can advise you. Look to Jesus tonight. Look to Him. Can you sing that chorus again? While she's singing this, I want you to ask the Lord tonight to begin to prepare your heart. I want to ask the Lord to make you uncomfortable with normality. And I want you to ask the Lord to make you uncomfortable with the parts of your life you have not yet yielded to Him. Now you say, Jordan, I'm a Christian. I gave Him my life. No, friend, you gave Him your soul. But your life is slowly being sanctified day by day. That's why Jesus said that if any man desires to come after me, let him first deny himself. Now watch this. That is a daily process. It is a choice to come and die every single day. Yet the reason we don't is it hurts our flesh. Friend, it's got to die. It's got to die. I was talking with a brother down here before service and we were talking about some of the greats who have served the kingdom of God and he said to me, please forgive me if I get the question wrong. He said, why do you not think we see more men like, and he, he named a wonderful man of God. I said, I think it's very simple. The Bible says the Spirit was given without measure. So God's not the one holding Himself back. It's the fact that oftentimes we hold ourselves back from Him. And we don't want to fully yield to Him. Because if you fully yield, friend, He will ask of things you don't even want to give Him. He'll ask for portions of your time that you thought belonged to you. The whole mistake there, friend, is you think you own your life. You don't. The Bible says... Do you not know that you were bought with a price? Your life is not your, okay, you don't belong to you. So you don't get to choose how your life goes. 
but yet we still do because we're not yielded to Jesus. So I'm going to ask tonight that the Holy Spirit begins to work in us. Before I bring this word, let's lift our hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, just begin to sing that again. I say yes. I say yes. Holy Spirit, I pray you begin to fill this room even now. I thank you you're here. Holy Spirit, we yield to you tonight. We need you so much. Yes, Lord. I want you to mean it with all your heart. Don't sing empty words. Mean it with all your heart. Whatever it costs. Sing it again, sing it again. I say yes. Every voice, every voice, every voice. Tell him tonight. I say yes. We say yes. Mean this with all your heart. Don't give him emptiness tonight. Mean it. I say yes David said, I will not give the Lord something that costs me nothing. Mean it tonight. Mean it. Lift it up, lift it up. Riba Chandra Baba Baba Sandra Baba Kira Baba Bantia. Jesus. Whatever it costs me. We worship you, we worship you, we worship you. One more time. I say yes, I say yes. With all your heart, church, with all your heart, with all your heart. Say yes to you. I say yes when it's hard. Yes, Lord. Yes, when it's easy. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We yield. Oh, we yield, we yield, we yield. We yield, we yield to you, Lord. Whatever it costs me. Whatever it costs. Just one last time, I say yes. I say just softly, just softly, just softly, softly. I say yes. I say yes. Every voice now, I say yes. I say yes when it's hard. When it's hard, Lord. Say yes to the call tonight. We surrender, Lord. We surrender. Wonderful Jesus, you're worthy of our lives. Jesus, we come to you tonight because we need you. We need you tonight, Jesus. We cannot do what you've asked us to unless you help us. For it is not by might and it is not by power. It is by my spirit, says the Lord. So Lord, we yield to you tonight. Holy Spirit, demand parts of our life we have not yielded to you. Demand them, I pray tonight, that your name would be glorified in all the earth. That the world would know you are the Savior. Lord, if there's ever a time the gospel has needed to be preached, it is right now. And Lord, here we are tonight saying, send us. Oh, friend, I pray I'm not the only one in the building tonight who feels that way. Lord, we pray, send us tonight. Lord, find here a church that says, yes, Lord, we will go. Lord, we will go where you tell us to go. We will say what you tell us to say, Lord, whether it makes us feel comfortable, whether it makes us feel uncomfortable, whether we understand where the funding's coming from, Lord, whether we're fearful. Lord, here we are. Find a people who says, Lord, send us, we pray. 
In Jesus' name we ask, so Lord, hear our lives. We lay them on the altar. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, can you say amen like you mean it tonight? Amen. 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 You may be seated. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Are you happy tonight? Oh, dear God, that was... Wasn't a promising start, Pastor. Maybe it was the accent. Are you happy tonight? Listen, it is such an honor to be with you. I know that you have no idea who I am, and that's probably okay because knowing about me is not important tonight. I am deeply honored that you would have me come and share. And I'll be very honest with you, Pastor. I'm a little upset that you had all of the missionaries come up before and share what they're doing because now I feel like a boy amongst giants. I feel very inadequate to be stood before you. But tonight my job is not to try and teach you anything. I feel very safe saying that I'm sure some of you have been serving the Lord longer than I've been alive. In which case I deeply commend you tonight and I honor you as those who have laid the trail so that my generation can walk behind you. And so I want to honor every single one of you in this room tonight who have served the Lord, those missionaries who are serving the Lord. I, uh, I want to honor you tonight, and I, I applaud every single one of you. So thank you so much. Tonight, as I shared, it's not my role or desire to teach you. I simply want to affirm what you already know. And so if you want to hear some deep, theological, profound sermon, I'm sure that pastor is preaching next week or something. And so I'm not that guy. I'm a simple evangelist who loves Jesus. I am not deeply complex. I love the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am a product of the gospel taking a jacked up young man and saving my life. I, uh, I have seen the wonder of what this gospel can do. And friend, I've got news for you. In a day and in an age where tickling sermon and motivational preachers are abounding in America, I am stood on the firm foundation that America right now needs the gospel of Jesus Christ more than ever before. Friend, I believe in the scriptures. I believe in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I believe this is the infallible word of God. There is power in the word of God. This is not man written. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Friend, I believe America right now needs the Bible more than ever before. Can you say amen? amen? But friend, I want to share very briefly why I want to share with you tonight what I'm going to share with you. I, 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 I'll be honest with you, I know many evangelists have the story that they were raised in a terrible setting and they were a horrible drug addict and God radically rescued them. That isn't my story. My story is that I was raised in the most perfect household you could ever wish to be raised in. My mother and father, as far as my earliest memories, they never read Jack and Jill went up the hill to me. They read about Noah building an ark and Daniel being thrown to lions and Joshua wanting to win a fight so he makes the sun stand still in the sky. And I thought all of this was normal, friend. And here's where I get even crazier. I still believe it's normal. I still believe that God can do that today. Because nowhere in my Bible does it tell me that God stopped doing those things. If he split an ocean then, he can split an ocean now. If Jericho came down then, Jericho can come down now in Jesus' name. I'm not naive, friend. I know my Bible. My Bible says he's a wonder-working God. He is a God of miracles. Friend, we don't serve a boring God who cannot see or hear or speak. He is alive today in Jesus' name. But I grew up around this my whole life. I remember my mother and father, Pastor, led me to Jesus at the age of seven years old. And I, I didn't know much at that age. I, I didn't even know that I was in sin. I'm like, I, I don't know what I've done, but if I have done something, I'm ready to get it right. I mean, how much bad can you do at seven years old? But I remember hearing my mother and father share a story with me that I'd always known. The message of the Son of God leaving his throne of glory 
to humble himself to come and save humanity who did not deserve him. And I remember I could take you, take you to the very spot there in England in a tiny town that is so small, even people in England haven't heard of it. So there's no point in me telling you guys where I come from. But in a little town called Rotherham, England, at seven years old, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And friend, I, I couldn't explain to you the theology of what took place. I could only tell you the reality. My seven-year-old heart said something just changed. The very next day, I went to school. I grabbed my best friend by the shirt and I said, you need to be saved. He said, why? I said, I don't know, but I got saved, so you need to get saved. <laughs> Friend, that was my first convert. <laughs> now, hold on. Since that day, I have changed the approach, <laughs> but the passion is still the same. See, it was so real to me at seven, I knew that what I experienced, other people needed to experience. I led my best friend to Jesus at the age of 10 years old. I was filled with the wonderful Holy Spirit. It was so real to me that no one could convince me otherwise. The power of God came on my life. And things began to change for me. I would go to bed at night and here's how I knew I wasn't a normal child. Like some of you figured out, Jordan, you're not normal now. Never mind as a child, but I, I get that. But I would, I would go to bed at night and I would have dreams of fields full of people as far as my eye could see and in the dreams I was preaching to these people now there was one big issue I couldn't talk very well in fact I couldn't talk at all to the point that in front of my own family when they said can you bless the dinner I would say that's how bad it was and yet God is giving me dreams of preaching to masses of people. This could never happen. But friend, this was so real in my life. I knew that God had done something in me when I would go to my friend's houses and they would have a picture of Michael Jordan on their wall or a picture of a soccer player. See, I, I adapted the American terminology for you guys there. <laughs> you owe me a well done because otherwise that would have been football. No, no. It, it doesn't count now, like that was manufactured from you, okay? <laughs> they would have these pop stars on their wall or whatever. But on my wall, at 11 years old, I had pictures of a man preaching to a crowd called Reinhard Bonnke. <laughs> and let me tell you what happened, friend. At 11 years old, my mother and father would order something called the Impact Magazine from Christ for All Nations. How many know what I'm talking about? Where's the OG Christians in here, okay? They would come to our house, this publication called Impact Magazine. Now, there's a good and bad part to this story. I sinned by stealing it from my parents, but for good reasons, okay? So I think the Lord understood. But I, I would look in these magazines of crowds bigger than you could possibly imagine. Reinhard would preach to up to 1.6 million people in one service. And I would take those pictures, I would stick them on my wall, and at 9 o'clock at night, which was my bedtime, I would look at the pictures as my parents turned off the light, and tears would begin to roll down my cheeks at 11 years old. Now, you may say to me, why were you crying? And my answer would be, I don't know. But something in my heart began to burn. When I saw what was possible for God to do with someone who would simply say yes to the call of God. I remember at the age of 11, I had my first opportunity to preach. It was at my youth group. It was so bad that if you were saved, <laughs> you might have considered getting unsaved. Like... <laughs> Heaven's watching going, no, like this, this wasn't the plan. Like the Lord's talking to Gabriel, like you might need to go down there pretty soon here because he's not helping the kingdom here. Friend, it was horrible. 
but my little heart was burning to do something with what God called, told me to do. It wasn't theologically sound. It wasn't well presented, but there was something in my heart that wanted to say yes to God with every fiber of my being. But during my teen years, I wandered away from the Lord in, in, in what was in my heart a very severe way. The Jordan who had had parents who taught him the scriptures and took me to church. See, in my growing up, I was in church six times a week. I was there Tuesday night prayer meeting, Thursday night Bible study, Friday night youth group, Sunday morning, Saturday night revival service, Sunday morning service, Sunday evening service. That was my life. But now the appeal of the world had begun to weave its way in my heart and the desire to fit in. The desire to be accepted. The desire to be like everybody else began to set in until Jordan who was burning for Jesus was now Jordan at house parties and nightclubs watching friends snort lines of cocaine off a table. But do you know what was amazing to me the whole time? I, I was like, I think my sister over here. I wasn't a good sinner. I wanted to be. I tried I just wasn't good at it. Like I just, I don't know what to tell you. I tried to be good at sinning. I just couldn't be good at it. Because the whole time I was trying to sin, Pastor, with a bottle of alcohol in my hand, a girl trying to drag me into a room, my heart's going, you're called to preach the gospel. God wouldn't even let me enjoy my sin. <laughs> like, I, I was trying, I'm like, can I have a night? Like just give me a chance to even experience this to decide I don't want it. And the whole time, God wouldn't even let me begin to love those things. I would sin, watch this, and be miserable. I would get home from house parties, Pastor. 4, 5 a.m. in the morning, I would put my earphones in on my MP3 player. And I would listen to sermons of Reinhard Bunke, Billy Graham, Pastor Benny Hinn. Catherine called the greats of the faith and I would fall to sleep with tears rolling down my cheeks knowing I was called by God but this fight was taking place in my life. Over the series of years, four or five years, the Lord drew me back to himself and at the age of 16, I began traveling on what we called itinerantly or full-time, which is nonsense because every Christian is a full-time Christian, just so you guys know, okay? You don't need a 501c3 to be a full-time Christian. Someone say amen, all right? You're not going to get to heaven and the Lord check your 501c3 credentials, all right? The Lord's not going to ask for that or at the gate. But at 16, I began to travel around the United Kingdom and I would preach a simple message of Christ crucified and raised to life. And I began to see the wonders of God in my life. In 2016, I moved to the United States where I married my beautiful wife, Kelsey. And the Lord began to continue using my life. And the whole time I knew, though, the gospel crusades and winning the loss is what the Lord had called me to do. But I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know what the Lord wanted me to do next in life. And so... I started with the little that I had in my hand. See, friend, to wait for God to give you everything, you'll be waiting forever. How many can testify to that? You see, listen, I, I need $15,000 for our project. If you wait till you've got it, friend, you might be waiting a while. Because Reinhardt said, God moves with movers, but he does not sit with sitters. Just for you. God moves with movers. He does not sit with sitters. God is a God of action. Remember, he put the food in the disciples' hands before it was multiplied. Read your scripture, friend. And as they went, the food was multiplied. In 2019, we held our first ever gospel crusade. And I would love to tell you, the field was full and it was glorious, but it wasn't. Because until you've learned to be faithful with little, God cannot entrust you with. 
our first gospel crusade, I had to believe God for $20,000. Now, you may as well told me I needed $20 million. That's how it felt at that time in my life. But we believe God for, and he brought in the funds. And the first night of our gospel crusade, we show up to the field and a monsoon ripped through that field, friend. Where I thought there would be 50,000, there was about 1,500, if that. But it's those moments that I discovered in my life, and I want to remember this. Not that I can teach you anything, but let me encourage you. God has never asked you to be successful. He's asked you to be faithful. Let me give you that again. God has never asked you to be successful. He's asked you to be faithful. And oftentimes in our pursuit of success, we say success rather than faithfulness and realize that we built something in our own strength. And the Bible says that unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in. But God also loves persistence in the kingdom. God loves a man or woman that says, if we fail at this 10 times, you better believe 11, we're going again. 12, we're going again. 30, we're going again. 50, we're go God loves something about that person that he says, no man having put his hand to the plow and turning back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Friend, there's, there's something about the Christian walk that if you get knocked down one time, you've got to get up. And if you get knocked down again, you've got to get up. And it's that pressing for the kingdom of God. Can you say amen? And so we began to hold crusade after crusade. We went to Colombia. We went to Kenya. We went to Zimbabwe. We went to, dear God, Pakistan. We went to Italy. We went to Switzerland. And we persisted and persisted. And friend, by the grace of God in the last three and a half years, we have seen just short of half a million first-time decisions to follow Jesus Christ. And I, yeah, go ahead. Give God praise for that. Give the Lord some praise. I tell you all of that as I listen to some of you missionaries. Brother, your story inspired me so much. In the middle of those crowds full of darkness, God is sending those who have this little lamp burning. But for in darkness, that little lamp becomes a flaming furnace that all around in darkness come to see the light of the gospel. Friend, I've been places and preached before where people said you might die when you go there. The problem is to the Christian, death is not a punishment, it's a reward. This is the problem with Satan. He threatens you with promotions. Because Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So here's the problem, devil. If you don't kill me, I'm going to preach. And if you do kill me, I'm going to heaven. So you don't win whichever way this goes. That is the glory of the gospel, friends. Can I share a few stories before? Like, I haven't started preaching yet because pastor told me there's no time limit. So, like, you guys okay? Friend, I, I tell you this. I'll tell you why. Because if God can do this for me, he can surely do it for you. I promise you, I am the least qualified person in this room. I don't have certificates on my, like, I go into pastor's offices and I get intimidated. Just certificates. I, for I can't even spell most of the words on the certificate. Never mind, earn one of them. I just knew that God had called me. I remember in the height of COVID, one thing I determined, I said, Lord, I'm not going to stop preaching. If the world shuts down, I will find a way to go and preach. If we're taking a boat, then we're taking a boat. But we're going to preach the gospel. And so all of our gospel crusades got shut down. I was meant to hold one in Kenya. We were meant to be reaching hundreds of thousands of people. And four days before our gospel crusade was going to take place, the president of Kenya called and said, you can't hold the crusade. We've got to shut it down. Pastor, we lost tens of thousands of dollars as a ministry. But here's the thing. It wasn't my money. It was the Lord's. So it was a seed into a harvest field. Can someone say Amen. And so I said to my team, okay, where can we go? I know where we can't. Where can we go? The problem was the place that was the most accessible was also the most dangerous. So they said to me, well, right now Pakistan's open. Now, friend, as an evangelist, when you're going down your list, <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm talking about. When you go, like, 
Hawaii, like, <laughs> you know? It wasn't near the top in terms of this would be a great place to go. But friend, for the sake of the gospel, it was an incredible harvest field. And so here's how bad it was, friend. It was the middle of 2020, everywhere shut down. My wife books the flights for me and sends me on a one-way trip to Pakistan because <laughs> there were no flights home. See, this will test if you're real about the gospel. It's really funny, right? While you were singing the song, I see, I turned around and I watched a bunch of you sing it. For this reason, God's going to question that. One day, God will come and see how much did that mean to you. God remembers things that we don't think are important. There are prayers I have prayed that years later, God has reminded, hold on, John, no, no, you once said to me, who am I talking to tonight? God pays attention to these moments. So when you sing, whatever the cost, God heard that. Maybe you shouldn't have sung it. Because what if the moment comes where God says, are you willing to now cash that check? Because you told me on the 30th of September, 2023, at the global, what's the conference called? Global Impact Weekend. You sang and I heard it, whatever the cost. But now you don't want to go because you feel uncomfortable, so you didn't mean it. Now maybe that's not the God you serve, that's the God I serve. Because all throughout the Bible, God came back and said, you said you would. You, Hosea, I know you feel uncomfortable right now because you had to marry a prostitute, but you told me this is what you're willing to go through to understand how I feel. So I remember I took five flights and flew 44 hours to get to Pakistan with no flight home. I'm the only Western person on the plane because there's a global lockdown. I'm on an international plane with eight people. I felt like I'd been kidnapped. <laughs> we, we arrive into the country. I've got this governmental visa. I don't even know how we got that. I get into the country after a 44-hour flight, and they say, okay, the service starts in six hours. We're driving you there. Friend, I didn't know what day it was. I didn't know what planet I was on. I just knew this. God has called me to come here. How many understand there's going to be days that you don't feel like preaching the gospel? I'd love to tell you, I'm sure my sister can tell you, you don't always feel like the guy next to you on the plane who's taking up all your seat room as well as his, sharing the gospel with him. I remember I stood on that stage in front of 80,000 Muslims and Hindus. We don't have time to see that. We might, we might a little later. You guys have already seen it, I think. I stood on that stage in front of Muslims, Hindus. I, before I got up to the stage, the crusade director said to me, brother, Pakistan's going through a very hard time right now. I said, oh, why? What's taking place? He said, well, about a month ago, a Western missionary came over here and some radical Muslims took them and burned them alive. And you thought that was a good idea to tell me. As I'm getting up to preach. So friend, I, I'm stood there on the stage waiting for him to give me the microphone. And he said, in five minutes you're on to preach. I said, no problem, I'm, I'm ready to go. At that exact moment, about 12 to 15 men dressed head to foot in black attire with machine guns. Come and stand about where you are, brother, in the, in the pink shirt. And they face the stage pointing the guns towards me. So I, I turned to my crusade director, I said, I have a question. <laughs> I said, who are they? Because we already had armed police there, and they, they're dressed as police. These dudes aren't. I said, who are they? He said, brother, I have no idea, but here's the microphone. <laughs> and hands me the microphone. Listen to me, although that sounds funny to you, it wasn't to me. 
Because I had a three-month-old baby at home and a wife and no cell reception. That's when you find out if the gospel's real to you. And that's where you find out that if Jesus was willing to bleed and die, that we could have the gospel. How in a moment like this could we not stand and proclaim the love of Jesus to Muslims and Hindus who are on their way to hell? So friend, I prayed, I took that microphone, I went out there and I preached the message of the gospel as well as I could. I preached Christ crucified, I preached the power of the blood, I preached the resurrection, I preached the ascension, I preached the return of Christ, I preached the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And friend, in that service alone, more than 64,000 first time decisions were made to follow Jesus Christ. Muslims and Hindus bowing their knee to Jesus. Now, for all my brothers and sisters who potentially don't believe that miracles still happen today, friend, in that service, we saw a girl raised from the dead. A mother, can I share this story real quick for you guys? I'm doing all this to provoke your faith tonight. I'm doing it to provoke you to believe that God can use your life. That the wonders of God you read about in your Bible are still for today. A mama, earlier in the day, was walking with her daughter. She's walking down the street and all of a sudden her daughter starts to grasp at her chest. And she can't breathe. She, <gasps> and she drops dead. A doctor happens to be coming by and he said, I'm sorry, your daughter's dead. How many know that's a good time for a miracle to take place? This woman wasn't a believer. But she had heard that there was a potential healing crusade taking place. So this mama carries her dead daughter through the streets and sits at the very back of the service. Now here's why I love this story so much. You'll find out next when I say this, but I love it because no man gets to take credit for this miracle. While the gospel was being preached, now watch this, not while some great man of God was laying hands, not while the prayer team was covering people in oil, while the message of the blood of Jesus was being preached. This young girl gasped, opened her eyes, sits up, and God brought that young girl back from the dead in Jesus' name. Now, bef between the point of her dying and being at the service, there was five or six hours that girl had been dead. And God brought her back from the dead. Friend, there is no one like Jesus today. And I've come to tell you tonight with all of my heart, this is the hour for every single believer to stand on the word of God and say, whether I'm a full-time stay-at-home mom, whether I'm a janitor in some school somewhere, whether I sweep the streets, God needs you now in this hour that we live in. Friend, you might not feel qualified. You might say, I don't have silver and I don't have gold, but what I do have, I will give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Get up and walk. God still does it today. God still does it today. So listen, I want to share with you for the next few minutes a call to preach the gospel of Christ like never before. Can you turn in your Bible to the book of Mark chapter 16? I'm going to preach to you for the next 15 to 20 minutes. And then I'm going to let someone much more qualified than me come and have this service. Mark chapter 16 And we're going to start with verse 14. This is a passage all of you know, I hope. But tonight I want this to burn in every single one of our hearts. I didn't know this was a missions conference, by the way. And so I feel tonight that God has really set this up in a divine way. Are you guys there? What about the other 90 of you? Because the leader's table is there, but no one else is. <laughs> oh, you're all on iPhone, so I can't hear your pages wrestling. I, friend, maybe I'm old-fashioned. I just don't feel like the devil's scared of my iPhone Bible as much as of a paper Bible. I just, you know, when I'm walking through a trial, I don't feel like waving my iPhone at the devil does much. But when I pick up a, a paper Bible, I feel like the devil takes notice, so... I can't have any theology to prove that. It just feels good in my heart, okay? 
The Bible says later, he appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table. And he rebuked their unbelief. Let's stop there real quick. It's fascinating that he never rebukes their fear, but he rebukes their unbelief. Ponder that for a moment. We know that they were hiding in fear from the Jews. But Jesus never rebukes them for being scared. He rebukes them for not believing. Because friend, God can work with a lot of things, but he cannot work with unbelief. And he rebuked their hardness of heart because they did not what? Oh, what, what, this, is the, this is the dialogue. I don't, I'm not a monologue preacher, okay? Help me preach. Because they did not believe. Say, I believe. Those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, shout that next word. Now shout it like you're Pentecostal. A little better. One more time. Much better. Go. Do you know what he did not say? Now she's just been trying to be the class favorite. We've already acknowledged you're probably the best soul winner in the room. Like we, <laughs> There's no more proving yourself that needs to be done. <laughs> Let me tell you what he didn't say. Wait in the church and pray they come to you. I didn't think that would get as many amens. Friend, listen to me. I believe in prayer. I believe in fasting. But you can pray and fast until you're blue in the face. But unless you leave these four walls, souls are not going to get saved. One more time, anyone? You can pray and fast until you're blue in the face, but the great commission was not wait. It was go. See, right, I'm going to quote Reinhardt a lot tonight, okay, because he's just a solid guy to quote. Reinhardt said this, if you want to catch fish, do not throw your nets in the bathtub. <laughs> throw them in the ocean where the fish are. Friend, I've got good news for you. Souls will get saved inside of this church. But this is not where the unsaved are. They are out there in the highways and the byways. And they are waiting for a church full of the Holy Ghost to get up and do something with the gospel. Can you say amen? amen. So he said what? Go. go. Touch your neighbor and say go. go. Into what part of the world? He did not say the parts that make you feel comfortable. He did not say the parts that you like. Friend, if this was down to preference, I would just hold crusades in Bora Bora or Hawaii. But that's not what the gospel says. He says, go into all the world and preach what? Let's stop for one second. Dear God, we need this right now in America. He did not say preach your opinion. He did not say preach motivational messages because motivation will still send you to hell. A little harsh for you? Friend, you can be motivated on Sunday and go to hell on Monday. Your opinion does not save anyone. The gospel does. The Bible says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Not your high preaching, not your tickling messages, not your motivational speeches, and not your favorite Facebook preachers, little messages, friend. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That means the blood, it means the cross, it means repentance, it means holiness, it means turning away from your sin, it means coming to the cross and admitting, I am a sinner in need of a savior. This is the gospel, friend. We do not get to condense it to today's culture. We don't get to compromise it to our generation. Well, my generation doesn't like it. Of course they don't. It's offensive. But does the Bible not say that the gospel offends the proud, but it gives grace to the humble? I want to speak to every single one of you today. 
We have never lived in a day and age right now where the gospel is more offensive. But for now, it also tell you the gospel is more needed than ever before. Sure, you'll get offended. Sure, it will hurt people's feelings. Sure, they'll be mad with you. But friend, I would rather make them mad and win them into heaven than compromise them and put them into hell. This is the call of the believer. Preach the gospel. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Here's the part that no one else wants to preach. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Friend, you cannot preach heaven without also preaching hell. If you truly love the lost, you will warn them of hell as well as promise them heaven. Can you say amen? And these signs will, say will, didn't say might, didn't say maybe, it didn't say if you get your correct credentials, I'm all for that friend, but that does not mean you'll flow in the supernatural. These signs will follow those who believe, say I believe, say I be now say I believe like you actually believe that you believe, okay. In my name, not the name of your ministry, not the name of your favorite preacher, not the name of your denomination. In my name, Jesus says, they will cast out devils. That's for you, friend. That's for every one of you in this room. You will cast out devils in Jesus' name. You will speak with new tongues. You will take up serpents. And if you drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt you. You will lay hands on the sick. And they what? They what? They will recover. Friend, I want you to understand very quickly. Tomorrow, I'm going to do much more of a teaching message. But tonight, my job is to stir your faith very simply. I want you to understand tonight. That you have been called and commissioned by Jesus himself. The commander of heaven's armies was the one who gave you this calling. Now when you came to Jesus, how many today in this room you say you've given your life to Jesus? How many have not? How many are not going to respond no matter what I tell you? <laughs> Some of you just did this the whole time. I love you still. When you came to Jesus, this commission was placed on your life. Now, this commission was so important to Jesus, it was some of the final words he ever spoke on this planet. Can we all agree with this? Let, let, me, let me set the scene for you, okay? Jesus has been nailed to a cross. He has been flogged until the flesh hung from his body. Thorns have been pushed into his head. Nails have gone through his hands. Nails have gone through his feet. A spear has gone into his side. He has gone down into hell. He has ransacked hell. He has thrust every ounce of power from Satan. He has arose victorious. And he is now with his disciples. And he has to give them a message that will get them through some of the hardest times in church history. Now I know that you read it like he sat on a little stone with his disciples giving a pep talk. That's not what happened. They have watched this happen to Jesus. And let me tell you what actually happened, okay? You read it as he said, go into the world and preach the gospel. No, no, that's not what happened. He essentially said to them this, go and preach the same message that just got me killed. Think about that. We go, oh, that's wonderful. He told them to go preach the gospel. No, yes, but no. He said to them, essentially, what I have just preached for the last three and a half years, the very message that got those people so angry, they nailed me to the cross, you go do the same. Can you see how the crowd might not have been applauding in that moment? Friend, look me in my eyes right now for a second. Although many of you have been laughing and it's just my sense of humor, I, I want to get something deep in your soul right now. The only reason, Pastor, we have a Bible in front of us today 
And the only reason you ever had the chance to hear the gospel was because those early church fathers paid in blood to preach this message and preserve it so that we could have it today. This wasn't a hobby to them. They knew this will cost me my life. See, friend, in May this year, I, I preached a, 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 I hate the word circuit, it's so gross. I, I preached around Italy. And when I was in Rome, I love to do some of the tourist stuff. So I went to the Colosseum. I went to Nero Circus. I went to Circus Maximus. How many know what these locations mean and what they stand for? If you don't, that's okay. But friend, these were arenas of death that were erected for the sake of entertainment, which became on the Nero a barbaric form of entertainment where they would find early church Christians and they would ask them a simple question. Are you a follower of Jesus? Well, Frank, you've only got two answers. Yes or no. And here was the outcome. If you said no, you were free to go. But if you said yes, those soldiers would take you from your family or with your family. They would take you into one of those circuses, which wasn't a circus at all. It was an arena of barbaric death. They would take the Christians, some they would nail to a cross and set them on fire. And others they would throw into the middle of the arena as wild beasts devoured them while they were alive. Frank, can you imagine watching your wife and your child be torn to pieces by lions while you're nailed to a cross burning because you said, I believe in Jesus, the Son of God. But the only reason you are saved today is because of those early church martyrs who loved not their lives even unto. After those, the early church martyrs, in the years of the early church forefathers. Then we get the reformers. Then we get the revivalists. We read of men like Wesley, Whitfield, Spurgeon, Finney, Wigglesworth, Billy Graham, Bonke. I've missed all the women out. Amy Semple McPherson, Maria Woodworth Edda, Corey Ten Boom. Catherine Coleman, friend, these people came after and they carried on the work that the early church martyrs had paid for in blood. Yes, they had their own challenges. Yes, they were persecuted. But friend, they ran their race. But here's the problem. Wesley was great, but he's gone. Whitfield was wonderful, but he's gone. Maria Woodworth Edda, outstanding. She's gone. Coleman, gone. Wigglesworth, gone. Bonky, gone. So what's the point? This baton is being offered to you on this leg of the race to continue running with the message of the gospel for your generation. It didn't end with Paul. It didn't end with Wesley. It didn't end with Bonky. This same message is being offered to you today by Jesus, but there's something he cannot do. He cannot make you say yes. This call, friend, this holy call from God. But friend, think of the humility of Christ. That the spreading of his name, he would entrust to vessels of clay. Now you might say, Jordan, how do I know that this is my call? Well, firstly, you have to understand this. Jesus never specified a demographic that the Great Commission was for. And let me tell you why this slightly annoys me and slightly has to be taught. People tell me all the time, Jordan, that was a wonderful message, but I'm not an evangelist. Well, my little non-evangelist friend, let me tell you something. 
when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he never once mentioned the word evangelists. Please go read your Bible and then disagree with me. He never said evangelists. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He just said, go. Now I want you to imagine the travesty of this. If we truly believe, Pastor, that only the evangelists are called to preach the gospel, let's, let's do some quick math here. Even in the fivefold ministry of apostle, pastor, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, you're telling me that only 20% of us are going to share the gospel. While the rest of you do what? Well, we wait for them to come to our church, then we decide. That's wonderful. But here's the news, friend. Statistically, more people are going to hell than heaven. You're comfortable with the idea that you're going to stand before God and say, I wasn't an evangelist. You're telling me that you're going to look into those eyes of fire and those nail-pierced hands and say, my pastor never commissioned me to be an evangelist. Friend, that would be the greatest travesty we've ever known. Well, let me give you a metaphorical example, okay? Because some of you still look perplexed at the idea of preaching the gospel. Let me, can I borrow you real quick? I'm a visual learner, so can you stand right here? Brother, let me borrow you real quick. Can you stand right here, okay? I, I want to give you a metaphor that I want you to remember for the rest of your life. This is how the proclamation of the gospel works, okay? I want you to imagine that Your name? Uh, Will. Will is a young man living on the west coast of America. And my brother, yeah. Ken, is a family relative who for the sake of this story, is going into some of the final years of his life. But God has blessed his life tremendously while he's been alive. He is a man who God anointed to create wealth. But Ken's in some of the final years of his life. Will, though he is for the sake of the story, let's say he's the nephew of Ken. He lives in California. Now, he doesn't have wealth. He's struggling in life. He's lost his job. He's not living at home anymore. And he's struggling on the streets, cold at night, hungry in the day, while his family member, Ken, is living in luxury. But the story goes that Ken is coming to the end of his life. He knows that his days are short. And so Ken contacts a lawyer and says, I want to begin to pen my will. So he begins to write down, I can hereby declare that at the moment of my passing, all of my equity, my estate, and all of my property will be left to my nephew. He signs it, the lawyer stamps it, and they put it in a safe. How many are tracking with the story up to this point? Days go by, and Ken, unfortunately, is laid up in hospital, and his life comes to an end. Now watch this. Legally, the moment that he takes his last breath, that will becomes active. By law, when his life has passed, that will becomes active and legally everything he owns now belongs to. Okay, but if you were to go to Will, you would find him on the street, still hungry, still cold, and still struggling. Now how can that be? Legally, he's a multimillionaire. Legally, everything that Ken owned is now his. So why when I go to him, is he still in the depraved state that he was before? I'll tell you why. Because until someone tells him 
that there is something owed to him. He will still be as poor and destitute as before the will was ever written. What Will needs is not someone to make him feel good. He needs someone to say, are you aware that you are now worth $30 million? You can get off the streets. You can get food in your stomach. But until someone shares that message with him, that note is entirely pointless. And friend, this is how the gospel works. There is an entire world out there who is poor in spirit. They are lacking the goodness of God. They do not know the hope they have in Christ. And everything has been done on the cross of Jesus Christ. Yet they're still broken. They're still depressed. They're still lost. They need someone to be the middleman that says, are you aware? There is hope for your life. Friend, this is how the gospel works. This is how the gospel works. See, friend, there is no greater injustice than to withhold the gospel from the world. Let me ask you a question real quick. How would you feel if you saw on the news tonight that a man in, oh, where are we? What city are we in? Uh, Palm this is Palm, okay. <laughs> Guys, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I go from week to week to week and I get lost. The amount of times I've walked in a hotel room and gone, where am I? Can you imagine tonight, Pastor, if you saw on the news that a man in Palm Harbor had had the cure for cancer for 20 years, but he just never shared it? What do you think about that man? Not good. What else? Evil. What else? Okay, how is it different with the gospel? How is it any different, friend, with us? That the message that saves a man's soul from hell resides in us and we don't share it. Friend, I pray tonight that the Holy Spirit inside every single one of your hearts brands the weight of eternity and what that means for the world. Can I have five more minutes? Is that okay? Thank you, guys. See, I want to remind you of a story of a man called Nehemiah. Nehemiah in the Bible was quite comparatively the king's right-hand man. The Bible calls him the king's cupbearer, but he was essentially his assistant. Now, friend, we don't know these details, but we can safely assume a few things. Nehemiah was not struggling financially. His family was taken care of. I'm sure he dressed in nice clothing. I'm sure he smelled good. He smelled rich. That's a real thing. You ever just hug someone and go, you smell rich. <laughs> like, <laughs> if you come up and hug me after, you're like, you're doing okay in life. But you're not rich. You know, you smell some people, you go, you smell rich. Like. He smelled that way. I smell like $49 Zara cologne. That's what I smell like. But he was doing well in life. But one day Nehemiah heard that the holy city of Jerusalem had been burned to the ground and something happened in his heart. He went to the king and he did something in the natural makes no sense. He asked for a demotion to go and become a builder in the dirt rather than the king's assistant. Now, friend, the world calls this foolishness. The kingdom calls this humility. And the Bible says that God will exalt the humble. And so he, he says to the king, sir, I know you've been good to me all of these years. But would you mind if I, if I stop being your assistant for a little while and I go and join those builders in the dirt and I rebuild the walls? And so he goes and he begins to build the walls of Jerusalem. Now, friend, can you imagine? Bless you. Can you imagine what that must have looked like for all the other people? Hey, there's Nehemiah. He used to be the king's right-hand man. Hey, Nehemiah, look at you now. 
You're just like the rest of us. Not rich anymore, are you? In the dirt, just like us, without your fancy clothing, now you're a nothing man. But Nehemiah understood this, friend. Listen to me carefully. He could serve that king for the rest of his life. But he understood this. I will be building a kingdom that will mean nothing in eternity. But by taking a demotion and using my mortal hands and my mortal body, I can build what will be an immortal kingdom that will be used for years to come, that the Lord himself will walk through the doors of this city one day. It wasn't just about the walls, friend. It was about building something that God cared about. It was about building something that would last in eternity. So Nehemiah begins to build these walls with all these men mocking him. He's putting his peace in the wall. Friend, you need to understand something tonight. You are not called to build the whole wall. You are called to put your brick in the wall. And here's the important thing you have to understand about this. My job in the kingdom is not to compete with you, it's to co-labor with you. Hold on, hold on, wait, 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 wait. If more churches understood this, there would be more unity and less competitiveness. See, so yeah, I, I, I was, not, not to bring it back to this again, but it was wonderful. I was inspired by what my, my brother does with, with these events. Some of you might have no idea who like someone like Wiz Khalifa is, but friend, it is like the demonic of the demonic. Am I talking truth, brother? But friend, imagine if I thought, well, I can do that too. I'll go and do that and compete with him and maybe I'll win more. Friend, that's demonic thinking. My job is not to compete with him. My job is to co-labor with him. How can I help you with that? How can I ensure that you're more effective in that role? Friend, if, if pastors stopped competing and started co-laboring, maybe entire cities could be one for Jesus. Maybe if churches were not firing shots at each other, but firing shots at the devil, more stuff would actually happen in the kingdom of God. You're not called to build the whole wall. Just put your brick in the wall and you'll hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Here's how the story finishes and then I'm done. That's my third time closing, if you're keeping count. <laughs> It's to give you hope. That's what I'm doing, okay? <laughs> but eventually, hope deferred makes the heart sick, so I, I won't do many more. In a minute, I'll have you stand to think I'm actually finishing. That's just to buy me 10 more minutes. Amen. When a preacher says stand, you go, oh, God, he's done. No, I'm not done at all. It's just to make you think I'm done. <laughs> but I promise I'm done with this. The Bible says one day Nehemiah is up on the wall. Watch very closely. And the Bible says some men from the neighboring city came to him and said, Nehemiah, come down. We want to talk with you. And Nehemiah gives this incredible answer that seems foolishness, but it is absolute wisdom. He says to them, I cannot come down for I am doing a great work. Let me give you that again. I cannot come down. I am doing a great work. Now I have a question for you, Pastor Barry. What if they were coming to offer him his old job back with double the pay? What if the king had sent them and said, hey, go find Nehemiah and offer him triple his salary. We'll upgrade his camel, <laughs> whatever. I don't know. <laughs> and we'll give his family medical insurance for the rest of their life. Now let me ask you a question. How is it hurtful to at least hear the proposition? I'll tell you how, because that's how the devil gets you. Nehemiah knew this. I'm not going to entertain your conversation because there's nothing you can offer me that is more important than what I am doing right now. I don't want more pay. I don't want more camels. And I don't want better medical insurance. I want to know that when I die, I did exactly what God had asked me to do. Because Jesus said himself, what does it profit a man that if you gain the whole world, but you lose your very soul? Nehemiah, watch this. He became possessed with purpose. See, friend, you could come to me after this service in Jordan. 
Here's a check for $10 million. Just stop preaching the gospel. I would laugh in your face. Because friend, we're not building for this life. We are building for the age to come. And when I get there, only what I did for God will matter. You say, Jordan, how does this apply to me? Well, maybe some of you, when you were 20 years old, can you come and help me on the keys real quick? It'll make them feel better. <laughs> Maybe when some of you were 20 years old, the call of God came to you. And he said something like, go be a missionary to China. And you said, Lord, of course I will. But first, let me graduate. So you graduate and the Lord comes again. I'm calling you. Go be a missionary to China. And you say, Lord, of course I will. But let me get married first. Five years go by. The Lord comes again and knocks. Come. Come to the wall. Build my kingdom. Go be a missionary in China. Lord, I will. But at least let us first have kids. Five more years go by. The Lord comes again. Come to the wall. There's a work to be done. Go be a missionary in China. Lord, I will. But at least let me see my kids grow up a little bit first. Ten years go by. The Lord comes again. Come to the wall. There's a work to do. Go. Be a missionary in China. Lord, I will, but at least let me first put my kids through college. Ten more years go by. And the Lord comes knocking again. Come to the wall. There is a work for you to do. Go. Be a missionary in China. And you say, Lord, I promise I will. But first... Let me retire so I've got more time. And one last time. Come to the wall. There's an empty hole where you're meant to put your brick in. There's a work for you to do. Go. Be a missionary in China. And the response comes, Lord, I'd love to, but now I'm too old. And you look back over your life and you give God excuse after excuse after excuse. I haven't got enough money. I haven't got enough courage. I haven't got enough support. And friend, you'll give God excuse after excuse. There's just one problem. When you stand before the throne of God, not one of those excuses will cut it. Are you saying that I'm going to have to answer for not doing what God called me to do? Absolutely. The Bible says we will answer for everything done in the body. Well, I don't have to use what God's giving. Well, what was the story of the talents about? Was that there to fill space? Or does it actually mean that God requires us to do something with what He's given us? See, there's going to day we stand before God and we're going to answer for what we did with the call in our lives or what we didn't do. See, I told you at the very beginning of this message, God does not do lazy Christianity. Now maybe you're not called to go to China, but maybe you are called to win your next door neighbor to Jesus. I don't like them. You were never asked to like them. You were asked to love them. But 
Friend, can you imagine if you were on a boat one day and you saw a man drowning in the ocean and you just idly watched him as he drowned? You imagine what you'd think of yourself for the rest of your life? You literally had the life ring in your hands. All you had to do, it's this simple. I know the Starbucks worker looks crazy with their four different shades of colored hair and their wild makeup and their nose piercings, but it's this simple. I know I don't know you, but Jesus loves you and he's got a plan for your life. Friend, you would not believe the amount of souls won by something as simple as that. Something as simple as, I have a question for you. I love what my sister shared. I use it all the time. If you died today, where would you go? Do you know why this question is so important, Pastor? Because there is one day on our calendar we cannot miss. You cannot miss the day that you die. The Bible says it is appointed once for man to die, then the judgment. We're all going to die. It's what we all have in common. So every man, woman, and child at some point has to consider the question, what's going to happen when I die? It applies to us all, friend. And this is where you can share the love of God. You just need a yes in your heart. I don't know how to share the gospel. Yes, you do. How did you get saved? Then you know the gospel. But sometimes it's enough to look in their eyes. Let me share one encouraging story with you and I promise. As long as I don't go over five, I'm good. A little while ago, I was on the way to the airport to go preach somewhere. And it was about 4 a.m. in the morning. I had to go to the airport, so I didn't want to get my wife and my baby out of bed at 4 a.m. Because I'm a good Christian. So I ordered an Uber taxi to my house. It's 4 a.m. I'm tired. I don't feel very Christian at 4 a.m. The Uber pulls up, Pastor. And normally they will get out and put your suitcase in the trunk to be courteous. Well, a man did not get out of his car. A gorilla of a human being. Friend, he was like Goliath's descendant. It was incredible to behold this human being that was built like a grizzly bear, tattered all down his face, scars on his face. I'm like, I'm going to die. <laughs> this is it. Lord, if there's any unconfessed sin, if this guy wants to kill me, there's nothing I can do to stop him killing me. He puts my suitcase in the car and it's only a 20 minute drive to the airport from my house so I started to feel a little more Christian towards him when he looked like he needed Jesus and so they need good ratings as drivers so they have to make small talk with you where are you going so he asked me and then he says what do you do I'm like oh buddy you're in trouble <laughs> I'm like if you wanted a quiet drive to the airport you asked the wrong question and so I shared with him what I did I showed him pictures of some of the gospel crusades and then he said this to me amazing part question pastor he said do you have any hope for this world I said I do And I shared what Jesus could do for a life that was lost. He began to talk to me about how his father hated him. His parents didn't love him. His brother had become estranged to him. They weren't in relationship anymore. And he said, do you think there's any hope for me? He said, an ex-convict 
fresh out of jail, street thug, tatted and scarred down his face. And friend, outside Orlando Airport at 4.20 in the morning, I took that man's hand. We prayed together and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. I share all of that. I share all that to tell you it's not complicated and it's not difficult. The world wants Jesus more than you realize. They're looking for him. They just don't know where to find him. And they're going to find him when you and I open our mouths and share the gospel. Can you stand to your feet? Friend, I want you to look me in my eyes tonight. Every person in this room. There is not one person here tonight not one person who is exempt from the call of the gospel. It is not a chore. It is a holy and joyous obligation. Can I say that again? It is not a chore. It is a holy calling and obligation. We get to deliver life to dying men and dying women. You have the message. You have the power. What we lack often is the yes. So tonight, I'm going to ask you to do something. Or, in fact, I'm not. I am going to offer you the opportunity to do something. But this is not a small deal. Because I told you, I believe there are promises we make here on earth that we will have to answer for when we stand before God. I really do. Now, you can theologically debate that with me. I'm just not willing to do that with you. I truly believe from Bible history and from my experiences with God, and I'm sure many of you nodding right now feel the same, there are promises and covenants we make with God that He holds to remembrance and that He will bring back to you one day. So I'm going to give you two calls tonight. Firstly, this might seem bizarre, but I don't really care if you think it's bizarre. I'm going to ask you, if you are in this room and you are not living for Jesus, you say, Jordan, you're out of your mind. We're in a church. We're all Christians. Well, friend, I went through a McDonald's drive-thru earlier, but I didn't become a burger because I went to McDonald's. Okay? And because you're in church, it doesn't make you a Christian. This year alone, I've been to 10 countries, international trips. When I went to Italy, I didn't become an Italian. And when I went to Switzerland, I didn't become a, whatever you call one of those. And when I went to Kenya, I didn't become a Kenyan. When I went to Zimbabwe, I didn't become a, whatever they are as well. Do you see the point here? Walking into church does not make you a Christian. You say, well, I've been following Jesus for 40 years. Okay, well, there are scholars who follow him through scripture. I'm not asking you to follow him. Do you belong to him? Are you living for Him? So well, how is that possible if I once prayed a prayer? Well, here's the thing, friend. We're not going to jump into a whole debate right now about what you think I'm going to talk about. But the point is this. You weren't called to make a one-time decision and use it as a golden ticket into heaven. I do not subscribe to that belief and I never will. In fact, I think the Bible teaches the opposite. In the book of Revelation, Jesus actually talks about names not being blotted out the book of life. Which tells me if some aren't blotted out, some... Debate that amongst yourselves. But 
friend, the life of a Christian is a life of purity and holiness and a life that is turned away from sin. When you said yes to Jesus, you did not just say yes to Jesus. You said no to a million other options. Did you see what I'm saying there? A yes to Jesus is a no to everything else. Let me prove this to you. When I said to my wife, I do, I also said I don't to every other woman on the face of the earth. Now, I didn't vocalize that, but in doing so, saying yes to my wife, it was a public demonstration, no to all the rest of you, however wonderful you might be. This is the same with Jesus. So tonight, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. I'm going to remind you of the scriptures. Jesus said that he who sins is a slave to sin. I've come to tell you tonight, New Hope Church, it is possible to live free from sin. I'm going to say that again because to some people that's news. It is possible to live free from sin. Now let me remind you of the words in the book of Jude. Now to him who is able, what does that mean? Only the Lord can do it in your life, friend. All of your discipline will not keep you free from sin. If that was the case, we're still under the law and not under grace. The law was kept by efforts and discipline. But there is a higher way and there is a new covenant to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Watch this. And to present you faultless before His presence with exceeding joy. From what sort of narcissistic God says, be ye holy if it wasn't possible. It's possible, but not on your own. You need Jesus. So I'm going to talk to every person in this room right now, as I do with every single time I preach. I've done this in Bible seminaries. I've done this in prestigious churches. Because from prestigious churches does not make prestigious Christians. I want you to close your eyes wherever you are right now. I'm going to ask you humbly for every person. Every person. Just close your eyes where you are. And I'm going to ask you a simple question. Are you free from sin? And are you living for Jesus? You might be here today and you say, Jordan, there's hidden sin in my life. Well, firstly, it's not hidden at all. God sees it, yet He still loves you. He hates your sin, but He loves you. And as Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, tonight He also says to you, neither do I condemn you, but now go and sin no more. Maybe you're in this room tonight and your wife has no idea, but you're bound in sin. Late at night, you fight with those temptations. And you feel guilty and ashamed. Maybe you're bound by unforgiveness. From before you go out there preaching the gospel, you need to know yourself that you are free and that you belong to Jesus. Tonight I'm talking to those who live in these perpetual cycles of sin. I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. And there you are back in it one day later. Because you can't get free on your own. The only way to live is to die. You need to learn to die to self. So tonight you must come to the cross. And you're going to rededicate your life to Jesus. Maybe you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus. Tonight, His heart is full of love towards you. Willing that absolutely none should perish. But that all would come to salvation. So I'm talking to you right now from the back to the very front. From left to right with every eye closed. If you are in here tonight and you say, Jordan, I'm struggling with sin. I'm not living for the Lord. But tonight I want to give Him my whole life. I'm ready to get free from sin. And I'm ready to fully live for Jesus. No more compromise. First love is what I want. 
you know tonight if you died you would not go to be with him but tonight you want to make that right like the prodigal son you want to fix it you want to come home say Jesus I'm tired of playing with this sin I want to be free I want to be saved then friend if I'm talking to you without hesitating without looking around without procrastinating just lift your hand right now wherever you are if you say that's me Jordan lift your hand quickly God bless you. I see you. Keep it lifted. Keep, there's no shame here. Keep it lifted. Thank you, Jesus. Keep your hand lifted. Keep your hand lifted. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Just lift that hand. I'm going to pray with you. We're going to have some of our team members here pray with you. Thank you, Jesus. Now listen, I'm going to ask you to do something. If you lifted your hand, I want you to make your way to the front here as quickly as you can. Just step out of your seat. Don't be ashamed. Just step out of your seat. Come stand right here right now. Come as quick as you can. Just come quickly. Come quickly. There's nothing to be ashamed of. This is not a contest. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, this is beautiful. Don't be ashamed of those tears. Don't you be embarrassed. Isn't this beautiful, church? I said, isn't this beautiful, church? This should mean something to us. Hold on, hold on. This should mean something to us. I think in church we get so off, oh, they're going to go down and pray a prayer. No, no, no. The Bible actually says in moments like this, they go from darkness to light. They go from lost to found. The Bible says there is rejoicing in heaven over one, one sinner that comes to repentance. Anybody else? You say, Jordan, tonight that's me. One of the greatest lies the devil will tell you is that tomorrow is the day of salvation. You're not promised tomorrow. I said, you're not promised tomorrow. I'll, I'll, I'll think about it and get right next week. Friend, what is there to think about? If you were drowning in an ocean and Pastor Ken comes and throw you a life ring and you go, give me 24 hours to think on it. To think on what? Not dying? Friend, think about the value of your soul in eternity. Now, I'm going to make this very clear to you, friend. You have two options in this life. You have heaven and you have hell. Do you know what the Bible says about hell? It is a place of eternal torment. Now, we can't grasp eternity in our minds, okay? We, we just can't. But for eons and eons and centuries and decades, whatever time limit you want to use, separated from God eternally. You say, well, God's loving. I'll get another opportunity. Well, let's hold on a second. Let me remind you of the young man who Jesus came to and said, follow me. He said, Lord, I will, but first let me bury my father. Jesus essentially said, we haven't got time for that. Let's go. Do you know what's amazing, Pastor? Pastor? We never read about that young man again. Think about it. We don't even know his name. We don't, scholars don't know his name. He could have been one of the 12 disciples. But because he wasn't ready in that moment to follow, Jesus never went back to him. Think about the rich young ruler. Do you read about Jesus chasing him? okay from we're not promised tomorrow but what we are promised is right here and right now Jesus is willing and ready to save